Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, we have something a little different for you. It's a bit of a moral dilemma. Joining us from Massachusetts, we have Olivia DiNardo. Olivia is the founder of SOA Goat Sanctuary, a nonprofit located in Harvard, Massachusetts, that provides lifelong holistic care to abused, neglected, orphaned, and slaughter-bound goats in need of a safe haven. Olivia is a self-proclaimed imperfect vegan. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here on Plant Your Seed. Let's address the elephant in the room. What do you mean by the words imperfect vegan and how can you run an animal sanctuary if you aren't vegan? So I will start by talking about how I became vegan and kind of what's led me to where I am today. Okay. In 2015, I was in the middle of a very intense graduate program in um, nurse anesthesia And what had started out as sort of occasional stomach upset GI issues turned into what was later diagnosed as full-blown ulcerative colitis. So I went from being relatively healthy to being quite ill and having very extreme gastrointestinal issues. And that started me down a path of some very dark and difficult years, you know, multiple failed medications. I eventually ended up on um, IV immunosuppressants that I got every eight weeks that somewhat controlled my symptoms, but, Mm -hmm. you know, having issues. I tried every diet under the sun. At this point, I was vegetarian, so I grew up with a vegetarian mom. And when I went to college, became vegetarian And then, you know, in the course of researching different diets for my ulcerative colitis, I came across a video of a calf being taken away from his or her mom. And I could not eat dairy after that. Mm -hmm. And so I went completely vegan at that point and, you know, did every variation of a vegan diet you can imagine, like gluten-free, nut-free, soy-free, everything-free, and just was not able to find something that worked for my body, you know, was still having symptoms, was still quite unwell. And this went on for quite some time until about a year and a half ago. I was listening to a podcast, actually, of a woman who had severe Crohn's disease, which is similar to ulcerative colitis, but a little bit more severe. Mm -hmm. And she talked about this protocol called the bean protocol that put her into remission. She's off all of her medications, you know, living a completely normal, healthy life. And at this point I had tried literally everything like acupuncture, homeopathy, like I said, every diet, supplement, herbalism, you name it, I tried it to try to get my gut better. And nothing was working at this point, even though you were vegan. A hundred percent vegan at this point. Were you still on IV immunosuppressants? (laughs) Immunosuppressants? Yes. At that point? (laughs) I was, yeah. And a number of other medications and I had bad side effects from the medications. So I was on medications for the side effects from the other medications. So, um, Yeah. So at this point I was really willing to try anything. So this woman who was interviewed that I heard, you know, her story, I was like, wow, you know, this sounds like something I could actually try, um, like as a last shot in the dark. Otherwise at that point I was like, this is just going to be my life. This is just going to be how I have to live. And I'm going to have to find a way to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. And So I contacted her because she became a health coach after her experience to help other people, you know, heal their guts and Mm -hmm. a number of other, you know, autoimmune issues, thyroid issues. It's worked for a lot of different things. And so I contacted her and, you know, she was like, this is the protocol. Like it has 
meat and it has eggs on it. And I was like, I absolutely won't do that. I'm vegan. You know, I, I won't, I'm not going to do that. And she's like, well, you know, you can try doing a vegan version of it, but really if you want to heal yourself, like at least consider doing the eggs. And so it took me a while, but I finally did. And, you know, I ate them from our own rescue hens. I'd already started the sanctuary at this point. And that was incredibly difficult for me to do. So basically I ate nothing but white rice and eggs for a long time. I rebuilt my whole GI system from scratch, basically just giving it a huge break and very, very slowly over time started to introduce other foods back in and vegetables. And, you know, it's it's been a year long process now, but I am off all of my medications. I'm off the IV IV immunosuppressants and I'm living symptom free now. That's fantastic. I struggled horribly with this decision because I don't believe that, you know, we should be exploiting animals in any way. So I really struggled with this and I lived with horrible shame and guilt about this. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm a lifelong perfectionist. I've struggled horribly with perfectionism my entire life. Trigger warning for people that are struggling with eating disorders. I just, I struggled with disordered eating for a long time. Um, Anorexia, bulimia, eventually that sort of developed into orthorexia. And I think part of what appealed to me about veganism initially, you know, I already had believed in, you know, not eating animals. I'd been vegetarian since high school, basically. Um, But I think part of what really appealed to me about veganism initially was how restrictive it was, like, in certain ways. I don't feel that way now, but initially when I came to it, it was very familiar in terms of the disordered eating that I had found a sense of comfort and control in from my younger years. So you know, when I first approached veganism, a lot of the messaging was very perfectionist, I found. And that sort of appealed to me on a subconscious level, not consciously. I knew I didn't go into it thinking, oh, this is restrictive and perfectionist. This is great for me. (laughs) But looking back now, I can see that that was definitely a motivating factor for me. And I think that a lot of the messaging is very perfectionist. It's like an all or nothing thing. And I don't think it leaves a lot of room for people who are trying to make the transition and have people, you know, saying vegan's the only way. And, you know, if you eat even a single animal product, you're a horrible person. And um, what ultimately helped me to share the fact that I'm not a perfect vegan, that I did, you know, choose this non-vegan route to heal my gut was actually one of our followers who reached out to me. And she said that she was really trying to transition to a vegan diet and she'd made all these changes. She lives in the Midwest. So, you know, that's not the most vegan friendly place. (laughs) And she'd been making all these amazing changes. She cut out pork, she cut out beef, she was hardly eating any chicken, just a little bit of fish and eggs. She was cutting down her plastic consumption, like eliminating single use plastic from her life. She was doing all these things. And she DM'd me on Instagram and she said, I just, you know, she just sounded so disheartened. Like she wasn't doing enough and she was not good enough. And I just reached, you know, I responded and I was like, you're doing amazing. Like, look at all the positive changes you've made in your life. Look at all the animals that you've already saved by cutting out those products. Like, and I just, I shared my own story. It's the same story that I just shared with you that, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. I did choose this route and I wish that an hundred percent vegan diet had gotten me to this point, but it didn't. And Does that negate all of the things that I've done? Does it negate the fact that all of these goats living here would be dead if it weren't for, you know, me running the sanctuary with a healthy body and, you know, all the other ways that I live a compassionate lifestyle? I guess some people would say that it does, but I choose to focus on all the ways that I am making a difference. And I told her to do the same. And she just 
you know, messaged me and said that she was crying because she felt like somebody was finally lifting her up for all the good that she was doing. And I feel like those are the people that really need to be lifted up because there are a lot of people out there trying to make changes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's amazing. I think those people need to be celebrated. And I think that those people are so important in sort of turning the tide towards a more compassionate society because for a lot of people, like, you know, especially people that are living in the Midwest, like this follower, she said that meat is just such a part of the culture there and everything that they do. It's like, she's like fish fry Fridays. That's just a thing everybody does. Like, mm -hmm. and you're just kind of an outcast if you don't go and participate. So I just think, you know, keeping that perspective that people within these very meat centric cultures the fact that they're making any changes, I think is amazing. And I think that's really where people need to be lifted up more than they are, you know, instead of just having this black and white, like you're either vegan or you're a horrible person. Like, I think there's a lot of gray in between. And, you know, of course I a hundred percent agree that what's happening to animals and the planet is horrific and it needs to change. Um, and there's a lot to be angry about. And I think if we could maybe direct that anger at the systems in place rather than individual people, that that would mm. do a lot to, you know, help people be more open to making those small changes that could eventually lead to huge changes or a completely vegan plant-based diet. Like you just never know where somebody's going to go if you just give them a little encouragement to get started and just to start making some small changes. Now, how long were you vegan before you ate eggs? For five years, six years. Hmm. How did you feel when you first ate an egg? I felt horrible. I felt so guilty I was actually crying, you know, eating it, thinking, is this something that I want to do? And ultimately I said, you know, I just, I have to give this a chance. It's like the last thing that I haven't tried to try to heal my gut that was just so wrecked at that point. It was just destroyed. So it was just something that was very easy to digest for my body. And, you know, just that and white rice, I, that's all I ate for a really long time while my gut just started to heal. Um, but yeah, like I said, I was consumed by guilt and shame. And the fact that I'm even like sharing this story like a year ago, like I would have never even imagined. I just had so much guilt and shame about it. But I guess I hope by sharing it that other people will just realize that they don't have to be perfect to make a difference. And I hope that eventually I can go back to a hundred percent vegan diet. That's always my goal. Um, but I've gotten to a point where I'm just giving myself a lot of compassion and realizing that I can do a lot more good in a healthy body than an unhealthy body. The eggs that you eat, or the eggs that you got at that time where you're eating white rice and eggs are from the chickens that you've saved. Correct. And those chickens, how many eggs do they normally have per month? They lay, depending on the age, we have some older hens too. Um, roughly an egg every other day, something like that. And we do feed the eggs back to the chickens as well, um, just to replenish the nutrients that they've lost. So again, it's, it's not perfect. And I wish that another, you know, that a hundred percent vegan diet had gotten me to the point where I am. Um, but I've accepted that it, it hasn't and I can still live a compassionate lifestyle in every other way. So your choice was basically to continue living with ulcerative colitis, which for people who don't maybe understand is a chronic disease of the large intestine in which the lining of the colon becomes inflamed and develops tiny open sores or ulcers. Now having ulcerative colitis 
puts the person at an increased risk of developing colon cancer. Correct. So your, your choice here is possibly colon cancer or eating eggs, which obviously is a, a difficult choice. Correct. So how did you feel when you realized that this was your choice? It was a real struggle, honestly. Um, and I was, I guess I was just so desperate at that point that I was willing to try anything to feel better. You know, it's basically like having, if you've had a really bad stomach flu or poison, food poisoning, it's like feeling like that, but all the time, like it never goes away. Just like horrible nausea, cramping, you know, bloody diarrhea. It's, it's not fun. So right. And that's every day, right? Yeah, depending on, you know, there were days that were better than others, but I would say the nausea and severe fatigue and the cramping was always daily. And, you know, the the medications for the most part had controlled the, the bloody diarrhea at that point, but I definitely was not feeling well and it was difficult for me to get through a day and do all the things that I needed to do. So during this time, you're having diarrhea all the time. You're trying to live your life. Mm -hmm. And there's really no options here. I, when I say I tried everything, I, I truly tried everything. And including, you know, so many different, med like dozens of medications as well. Um, so, yeah, I think I was just truly at the end of my rope willing to try absolutely anything. And when I heard her story, which was very similar to mine, the woman on the podcast that I heard, I just figured it was like a last ditch attempt, you know, and after that, like I said, I was just willing to kind of accept that this was the hand I was dealt and I would just make the best of it. When you're thinking about that decision to eat eggs, what sticks out in your mind? I think not wanting to exploit an animal, not wanting to take anything from them. Um, and I guess I was able to justify it because the hens are in my care and I know how loved they are and I know that they will never be harmed. They'll never, you know, be sent off to slaughter a year after they start, you know, start laying eggs because their production starts to decline. Um, and we have a rooster. I know that, you know, that doesn't make up for the, the millions and millions of roosters that are killed every year because of eggs, but we do have a rooster as well. Um, so I do feel bad about it. And I wish that this wasn't how I hid heal. I wish that I had a different story, but I think I've just come to a place where I'm so grateful to be healthy again. And I'm able to give more of myself to the sanctuary and hopefully my imperfect story will inspire somebody else to just start taking steps towards a more compassionate lifestyle. However that looks for them. If it means, you know, starting to cut out meat, starting to cut back on dairy, starting to cut out eggs, whatever step that they want to take. I hope that by sharing my story, it will inspire them to do that. And I hope that a lot of positive change will come from it. Now, have you tried giving up eggs? I have. I did multiple times sort of early on, and I found that my symptoms would come back. And I've, you know, cut them out for the most part now. You know, I've cut way back on them. Mm -hmm. um, I find that sometimes, you know, during stressful times, I sometimes need to go back to eggs and white rice. It's just sort of my safe place that I know I can return to and my symptoms will go away and then I can rebuild from there. So like I said, my goal is ultimately to get back to a hundred percent vegan diet. I hope that I can do that, but I'm just giving myself a lot of time. You know, it took 37 years for my gut to be wrecked to the point that it was. So I think it's just going to take a long time for it to heal again. And I'm just giving myself a lot of passion and compassion and patience and time. So what does your 
life look like now as far as your ulcerative colitis? Are you in remission? I'm in remission now, which I never thought I would say, but I am so happy with the way that I feel now. The energy that I have, just no GI symptoms anymore. I just, I feel like I have my life back and it is such a gift and I don't take that for granted. And I'm so grateful to our hens, you know, for, for helping me to get here. Um, and I just hope that I can always do right by them and give them the absolute best lives possible and just do a lot of good in the world and help a lot of animals and help a lot of people to move towards a more compassionate lifestyle, plant-based lifestyle. Have you been open with your followers and other sanctuary owners about your imperfect veganism and your story? I have, I've made multiple posts about this. Um, and the response that I've got has honestly been incredible to me. Like so many people thanking me and saying how much they appreciate my honesty and that it really helped them to feel like that this the small changes that they're making are making a difference that you can make a difference by just starting to take some steps. You know, there's this sort of all or nothing approach that I think is not helpful to the movement. Um, and you know, there's that quote, like don't do nothing because you can't do everything. And I think that applies here too. just start doing something. Do you feel that your imperfect veganism helps others realize that every little bit helps? Based on the responses that I've gotten to the posts that I've made, I think so. I think, you know, it really helps people feel like starting to make small changes does make a difference and that it is worth doing and that they should keep going, you know, don't stop there. Just keep going. Just keep making those small changes. It really does make a difference. And I think, far more people are open to that idea than just going full vegan overnight. And I think we need so many more people making those small changes and working towards a more compassionate lifestyle than just, you know, a handful of perfect vegans. Not that they aren't doing amazing, but I think that there are so many more people who would be open to just making some small changes and seeing where it goes from there. Do you feel it's okay for other people to eat eggs or is that something that you don't decide for other people? I can't decide what's right for anybody else. You know, that's a decision that each individual person has to make. And if they're in the same boat that I am, then that's a decision that they have to make and that they have to live with the choice. So I could never make that decision. Um, I think that the, the systems that are in place that exploit animals are absolutely horrific and that we need to do everything we can to eliminate those systems. Um, but I can't tell an individual person what they should or shouldn't do. That's something that they need to decide for themselves. How has your eating eggs affected your values? I think that it's honestly gotten rid of a lot of the judgmentalism that I had when I was sort of a new vegan, mm -hmm. um, which I think has made me more approachable. You know, a lot of people have said that they're willing to actually have a conversation with me about the changes they're making because they feel like I'm not judging them. And I'm not, I, I don't judge people. I don't know what their circumstances are. Sure. I don't know what, you know, their upbringing was or what values they have. So I think that that's a huge part that I've let go through my own journey. And I guess I've just let go a lot of, of a lot of the perfectionism that I grew up with. And I think that's been a positive thing for me. Again, I wish that this wasn't how I came to the place where I am mm -hmm. and I'll reiterate that, but it is. And I hope that by sharing this story that maybe it will inspire other people to just be imperfect vegans and 
If you can't be 100% vegan, if that's not within your reach at this moment in time, then be an imperfect vegan like me. And maybe over time you will become a quote unquote perfect vegan. But I think we also need to realize that there is no such thing as a perfect vegan. Like just by existing on this planet, every single one of us does harm, you know, by sure. driving a car, by washing our clothes and releasing microplastics into the water, by using single use plastic that some poor sea turtle is going to try to eat and die, you know, like using palm oil in your vegan snacks, you know, that's harming orangutans whose habitats being destroyed for palm oil. Like you can go pretty far down these rabbit holes of the ways that you're harming the planet just by existing on it. So I think all of us are causing harm and it's up to each of us to try to offset that as much as we can by the way we live our lives. What does the word SOA mean? And what was it about the word that made you decide to use it for your sanctuary? SOA is a Tibetan word that means to heal, mend, and nourish. And I actually saw this on a Tibetan calligrapher's Instagram page that I follow. He does beautiful calligraphy. Um, Tashi Mannix is his name. And I saw it on a post that he made about his brother who was in a really bad car accident and was in an intensive care unit fighting for his life. And he painted this word SOA and he, you know, described what it meant and what a powerful word it was in terms of promoting healing. And when I saw that, it just always stuck with me. And when I was thinking about what to name the sanctuary, that just immediately came to mind because this is a place of healing and it's a place where animals can come and live out their lives in freedom and peace and where they're given respect and love and pampered for the rest of their lives. So how long have you had the sanctuary? We rescued our first two goats five years ago. Um, so this was when I was still pretty sick. Um, and, you know, there were there were varying degrees of sick throughout my journey, and this was a particularly bad one. Um, I wasn't going out very much, and I was on Instagram a lot, and I started following Goats of Anarchy. And absolutely fell in love with the goats. And my husband saw how happy the goats made me. And he's like, why don't we just rescue a couple goats? And at this point, we lived in on 0.2 acres in like a residential area, not even remotely a farm or anything like that. And I thought he was joking. And he's like, no, seriously, like look into it. And it turns out that our area was zoned for farm animals. So we could have goats on our property. And we spent about a year researching them and learning everything we could. And we rescued our first two goats from a local dairy farm as dairy coals. And we just planned to have them as family pets. You know, we've always believed in rescue, but we never planned to start a goat sanctuary. And a year later, we decided to rescue two more uh, baby boys from the same farm, um, and it kind of grew organically from there, you know, it got to a point where we couldn't continue rescuing more goats on the property we had. And we made a decision to move to the current property we're on. And we've just grown from there. And, you know, my first two goats were such an important part of my healing. They just gave me so much to look forward to. They gave me something to get up for. Even when I felt horrible, they made me smile no matter how bad I felt. They were just such an important part of me healing. And so, so I really is what I say is it's my attempt to repay a debt that can never be repaid. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> they just mean so much to me and not just the personal debt that I owe to them, but just the debt that humanity owes to these animals for the ways that they're exploited. And so 
that's really at the heart of Zoa is just repaying this unpayable debt to these amazing animals. So in 2017, Mm -hmm. you started the sanctuary by just adopting a couple of goats because you were really sick. Correct. Yep. How did you manage the goats and then the sanctuary while you had this ulcerative colitis? It was incredibly difficult, honestly, but I feel like it also gave me a lot of purpose when I could easily have just kind of given into the disease and just let that become my identity and just, you know, sit on the couch and not do anything. That would be really easy to do when I felt that horrible. So I feel like they really gave me a sense of purpose and a reason to continue living my life instead of just sort of giving in to the symptoms and how horrible I felt and focusing so much on that. So it was difficult. And thankfully I have a very supportive husband who was able to help me when it was just a lot. Um, but like I said, I think they were just so much a part of me getting through this disease that I can truly never repay them for that. So the goats gave you a sense of purpose. They did, yeah. Have you reached out to Goats of Anarchy? So we actually have rescued a number of goats with Goats of Anarchy since then. Um, So we've taken in, I think, nine goats through them now. So it's it's been definitely special to, to work with them after they truly inspired SOA. You know, we mm. SOA wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them and the inspiration that they gave me. So that's definitely been special. What does holistic goat care mean? And what was it about this approach that you feel is right for the goats in your care? So by holistic goat care, I mean that we use a lot of alternative therapies in addition to conventional veterinary care. So we use a lot of herbs. Um, I've studied human herbalism and one of our goats, Merlin, who was actually one of the first two that we rescued, has a chronic skin condition Mm -hmm. that our vet tried everything under the sun to heal, like all sorts of different medications. We did skin biopsies and scrapings and, you know, just everything you can imagine. And she basically said, there's nothing else we can do. This is probably an autoimmune disease. He's just going to have to live like this. And he just had, you know, itchy, red, irritated skin. It would start to break down and get sores at some point. And I just said, there has to be another way. It's kind of like with my own healing, like there has to be another way. Like I just have to keep trying. And so I started using herbs on him, um, just using what I knew from human herbalism and obviously research to see if the herbs were safe for goats to eat. But I started using herbs and over time his skin completely healed. And so I've just started incorporating a lot of other herbs into our goat's care We have several goats with arthritis and mobility issues, so we use herbal blends for them to help support their joints and reduce their inflammation. And we also do um, flower essences, which works more on sort of their emotional state. So whenever we rescue new goats, we have certain flower essences that we use to help them adjust and calm down and process all of the trauma that they've experienced Um, so I think those are, you know, the main ways that we use alternative practices. We also use red light therapy and I think just take the whole, the whole animal into consideration, not just their physical health, but their emotional health as well. What do you mean by red light therapy? So, um, red light and then cold laser also we do. So it's 
um, basically using laser to apply to the joints of the animal. And it really helps to promote blood flow and healing and reduce inflammation. Now, is that something that you have on the property or do you take the goats somewhere? No. So I actually got a cold laser certification and we have a laser that we use on the property. So it's great. I actually, I tried to find somebody who was willing to come and do the therapy on the goats and I couldn't find anybody. You know, a lot of them will do it for horses, but they said not for goats. So I just took matters into my own hands and I got the certification myself and have been using the the laser on particularly one of our goats who has um, CAE virus, which causes very severe arthritis in one of his legs. And he's doing incredible now. You know, he's walking, he's running, he's living a normal life now. And we're very grateful for that. Now, is that something that's normal with um, goats having arthritis? So with this particular virus, um, it is it is common for them to have severe arthritis. And then as they get older as well, it's normal for them to get some arthritis, just like people do as they get elderly. Where did you get the courage to actually start the sanctuary? I think it's from the goats themselves, just seeing how abused they are and the ways that they're exploited. I just wanted to do something to offset that, however small it may be in the grand scheme of things. Um, I just felt so strongly about it. And just also, just like I said, how much they had done to heal me and help me through such a difficult time. I just felt like it was the least that I could do to try to really devote the rest of my life to making this world a kinder place to, for animals. What was it about goats specifically that you identified with? I think just how much personality they have and, you know, just they're funny. They're so unique. Each of them has such a unique personality and they're so affectionate. You know, when people come on our tours, you know, we give tours to let people come see the goats and hear their rescue stories and, I think that that helps a lot of people to make the connection mm -hmm. to a more compassionate lifestyle just by spending time with the animals. I think that's so powerful. So we do offer tours of the sanctuary and I would say at least 90% of the people who come on the tours will say, I had no idea how much they're like dogs, you know, just in terms of how affectionate they are, how unique each of them is. They have their own likes and dislikes and, our goats love having their hooves rubbed. So they'll come up to you and they'll lift up their hoof to have you rub their hoof like a dog would, you know? Mm. So I think just how much personality they have is very special. And I think with, you know, watching the goats of anarchy goats in particular, just seeing them overcome so much when I was, going through such a difficult time was really inspiring to me and just seeing how resilient they are and how they're willing to take the, the horrible hand they've been dealt and just still live wonderful lives. Obviously, thanks to the support of all the amazing people at Goats of Anarchy, but I think just their will to survive and you know, they have this, the saying at Goats of Anarchy, fight like a goat. And I think that that really struck a chord with me when I was going through such a difficult time. What's one thing that's really exciting for you at SOA and in your life right now? I think sort of taking the sanctuary to the next level and expanding, you know, we have been able to work out a deal with one of our neighbors to acquire additional land um, that would allow us to put another barn on the property, which is really exciting. So I think just continuing to expand and grow and hopefully rescue more goats and inspire more people to live a more compassionate lifestyle, just continuing to grow and expand. And how many goats do you have on the property? We have 26 goats right now. 
What is one habit or hack tip that you use to stay on track with your diet? Mm, I think the fact that I am so healthy now after being incredibly unhealthy for so long is really my motivation. Like I don't want to lose what I have. Like nothing is worth (laughs) losing the health that I've gained because I fought so hard to get here and it was so difficult for so long. Um, I think maybe for people who haven't gone through a really severe chronic illness who don't really know what it feels like to completely lose your health for an extended period of time. It might be difficult to understand that. Like I, there are certain things that I just don't eat and that a lot of people would be like, Oh, you know, you don't eat that. Like I don't drink caffeine anymore. And I was a huge coffee person. Like I used to just have huge, like cold brews every day. And so, you know, a lot of people are like, how can you not have coffee anymore? And I'm just like, I feel so good. Like it's not worth it to me. Like it just isn't because I know how it feels to be that sick for so long and to be healthy again and to feel good and to have the energy I need to grow the sanctuary. Like that's, that's my motivation to stay on track. How long were you sick? Over five years, six years. So five or six years you were dealing with having basically food poisoning every day. To varying degrees. Like I said, there were some days that were better than others, but it was a very, yeah, a very difficult five to six years. I'm just curious, like, how did you get through that? I mean, just on a daily basis. I mean, like, it's so much to deal with. You must have got so tired and angry and upset and having to deal with this every single day. How did you get through that? Yeah, it was, I mean, it truly was the goats that got me through it. I feel that very strongly. Um, it was, it was a very dark time. (laughs) So, um, I'm grateful also for my husband for all the support that he gave me throughout all this. And I would say that him and the goats really, got me through this. Now, when you say it's a really dark time, can you give me an example of that? I think, you know, just sitting on the bathroom floor, feeling like you could not possibly feel any worse and having absolutely no hope in sight that it's ever going to get better and just trying to grapple with that, like, how do I keep going when I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel because I've tried so much and I still feel so horrible. And, you know, it's just those sort of rock bottom moments where you're just like crying on the bathroom floor, like wondering if it's ever going to get better and trying to pick yourself up and go to work and (laughs) deal with all the stuff that you need to in your life. And, Um, and like I said, I was a chronic perfectionist, so I felt like I couldn't not do a lot of things that at this point in my life, I'm willing to not do if I feel like I need to rest. Like I've given myself a lot more compassion and grace at this point in my life. Like if I need to just have a day to rest, then I can ask somebody to help me. Like like I wouldn't ask for help either at that point. So I really was, I think that definitely exacerbated the issue. The fact that I was so type A and so driven and so perfectionistic that I really hindered my own healing. Um, so I think that definitely exacerbated things, but, but yeah, it was, it was a really difficult time all around. When you were sitting on the bathroom floor, mm-hmm. did you ever think it was going to end? I guess I always hoped that it would, but there were times that I just, I really didn't think that it would, that I just thought that this is going to be the rest of my life. And how do I, how do I process that? How do I, how can I find a way to be happy while feeling this way? Um, but I guess I, 
always had that glimmer of hope that somewhere out there, there was something that would help me. And I think, you know, when I finally heard that podcast interview, it just lit something inside of me like, wow, maybe this could work for me too, even though I've tried everything. And I kind of went into it very skeptically and obviously with a huge amount of guilt and shame around the moral dilemma that it created for me. Um, but I guess I always kept hoping that there was a way that I could be healthy again. What was the feeling when you thought that you were going to be healthy? That first feeling that, wow, this, this actually could work. I was, I think I was very skeptical at first. Like I didn't want to get my hopes up because you know, I had before and then I got sick again. And so I think for a long time, I just sort of didn't allow myself to feel that happiness over feeling healthy again. Like I was sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. And, but when I finally allowed myself to feel that it was just indescribable. Like I just couldn't believe that this was working for me and that I felt good again. Like it just brought me to tears, like happy tears that I could have my life back again. I mean, it's such a gift and I never, ever take it for granted. Like every day that I wake up feeling healthy, I, it's truly a gift that I cherish and I just want to make the most of it and do the most good that I possibly can with this healthy body. When did you decide that it was over or have you even decided it's over? I think that it's something I will always have to work for by maintaining a certain diet and lifestyle. And I think it's something that could very easily be taken away from me if I let myself backslide and fall into old habits, whether those are, you know, lifestyle habits or diet habits, um, if I just, you know, push myself to exhaustion and burnout, I think I could very easily slip back into a flare. So, you know, I, I still have ulcerative colitis. I'll have it for the rest of my life, but it's in remission and I hope to keep it that way. And, but yeah, I I don't take it for granted that I can just do whatever I want now that I've reached this certain level of health. It's something that I plan to work for every day, but it doesn't feel like a chore to me. It feels like a gift that I'm giving myself. Does ulcerative colitis ever actually heal? It, it's definitely healed, but I think that it can always come back. You know, you can always go back into a flare. No matter what you did right now, like if you had coffee or whatever, that would flare it up? I think it absolutely could if I just, you know, completely went off the the protocol that I'm following. I think that it definitely would. Yeah, I just think that I would be too scared to ever change anything, right? Because (laughs) I would just be like, oh, my God, I, I can't believe that I am not on the bathroom floor here. Whatever it takes, this is what I'm doing. Right, exactly. And so that's, you know, when people are like, oh, just have this, just eat this, just have a coffee. It's like, it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. And early on, I did try, you know, I'd be like, oh, maybe just a little bit of this, maybe a little bit of that. And then I would get symptoms again. And you do that enough times and you just, you realize like, okay, it's just not worth it. It truly isn't like nothing is worth getting sick over again and going back to that place. So I don't see it as restrictive in any way because restrictive was the way that I felt when I was sick and, you know, eating a particular way that's maybe different than a lot of people eat. For me, it doesn't feel restrictive at all. It feels like freedom because I have my health back. So do you calculate everything that you eat? I don't, not in terms of like calories or macros or any of that. No. I just mean on how it's going to affect you. Oh, I think I know my body so well at this point that I know which foods are going to 
not agree with me and which ones are totally safe for me to eat. So, um, I don't really push the envelope too much anymore at this point. I'm really happy with the way that I eat and feel. So I basically just eat, um, tons and tons of vegetables and lots of beans and, you know, rice I'll eat and I, I still don't do a lot of gluten. Um, that doesn't really agree with me, but it's basically just a high fiber, like high vegetable diet, just tons of vegetables and beans and, you know, the little bit of eggs when I need them. So how many eggs do you eat? We'll just say in a week. I think it depends on how I'm feeling, but I would say maybe like half of the time I would, half the days, you know, I'll try to, I'm sort of trying to slowly eat less and less of them and just see how I do. Um, again, I don't want to do anything too drastic too quickly, but I am sort of working to cut those out and just see how I feel not eating them. That's totally understandable. I mean, from what you went through. Right. Such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. What's the best way for people to follow you, support you on Instagram, the web, on social media in general? So we are at um, So A Goat Sanctuary on Instagram, Facebook, and then our website is just www.soagoatsanctuary.com. So you can find us on any of those places. Thank you so much, Olivia, for being on Plant Your Seed. Thank you so much for having me. It was so fun being on the podcast. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.